seeing this struggle in the womb of Rebecca in our Torah portion, it shines this entirely new light. Um, it shines this whole new light on the struggle that we see playing out, not only in the Christian world, but really in the entire world, in the entire world. As a matter of fact, as I read through the Torah portion on Shabbat, along with the insights of the sages of Israel, I emerged with an insight, not only into what's playing out in the world, but perhaps even more importantly for myself, uh, it was an insight into my own heart, into my own journey. Since uh, And this has really been happening in me since the world changed on that fateful day in October on October 7th, and, and you know, many of you who have been here for years from the beginning, I'd be interested to hear whether you've seen what I'm about to talk about here within me, because this insight came to a head this past week after I had two back-to-back -back interviews on the farm, because Jeremy, you know, Jeremy and I have patrols and guard duty um, for at least four hours a day, um, you, you know, and we're right there in, in the middle, and so I can't leave the farm very often right there in the middle of the day like that. And so I say, if you want to interview me, you're welcome to come out to the farm. And a lot of people are scared to even drive out there. But on this day, two people did. And the first interview is by my friend named Joel Gasper. Go Goel Jasper. Goel Jasper. Goel means, uh, you know, redeemer. Jasper. Anyways, he re interviewed me for his podcast called Return Again, which focuses on the story of Jews who have returned to the Holy Land. Shana loves it. Uh, maybe you guys would enjoy it also. Anyways, the second interview was by a Christian friend who came out to the farm to interview me for his podcast about the war and how it's playing out in the land of Israel. Anyways, after both of these interviews, um, I returned to my family that night and I sat there and I was just reflecting on the words that I myself said on these podcasts that were just echoing through my head. And I was feeling really uncomfortable about it, even a bit sad. I felt like someone who listened to those podcasts or even past sessions, the past sessions of this fellowship since the war would walk away with, with I think, a skewed perception of who I am, justifi justifiably, legitimately, based on my very own words. Because when I zoomed out, the things I heard myself saying, and the anger and the vitriol with which I was saying it, it just felt unrecognizable, like it wasn't even me. Have you guys sensed that in me over the past few weeks? I feel like sometimes I'm channeling my father because he sort of lived in that in that headspace. But anyways, since the war broke out, I've been declaring again and again how badly I want to go to war, how badly I want the opportunity to kill as many Hamas terrorists as I could, how badly I wanted to kill each and every last one of them, and that if they fortified their military headquarters under schools and hospitals, that Israel shouldn't think twice before destroying them as well, and that if there were any innocent Gazans that were there that were killed while wiping out Hamas, that their blood was on the hands of Hamas themselves. And uh, and while I stand by, I stand by everything that I said in both of those interviews as, as absolutely true. But on the deepest level, I was just feeling like it isn't. It isn't really true. On the deepest level, like Jeremy sort of alluded to there, interestingly enough, it really isn't my desire to kill anyone. My greatest desire really is love and peace and harmony and friendship. And those who know me well know that that's just true. It's not to kill. But I was saying these things, and I think in the way that I was, not only, you know, for the interview, but even more so for myself. You know, I was saying it to strengthen myself, I think, to keep this gavura to keep this very real strength and conviction alive within me, to keep this warrior spirit alive within me, because, you know, it really isn't in my deepest nature. And when you go out to war, you have to want to be there. You have to be ready to fight. You have to want to fight because if they do and you don't, it's not going to be a good thing. Anyway, so I actually reached this level of self-awareness of why all of this was, was happening when reading through the Torah portion, uh, particularly along uh, with the teachings of Rav Kook, uh, this was uh, actually a teaching shared by Rabbi Goldscheider, who shared the teaching of Rav Kook um, from his uh, powerful book called Midbar Shur. Anyways, in it, he teaches about the fundamental nature of both Esau and Jacob. You see, Esau's very name comes from the word Asa, he made, like he came out of the womb big and hairy and like ready-made. He was full of power and domination and brute strength. It was all like right there. It had to be fully made right there, like 
That's the soup. Give me the soup. I don't care what it is. I need it now. Right? Whereas Jacob's name, Yaakov, comes from the word heel, which is the lowest part of the body, which symbolizes, you know, humility and and uh, kindness. Anyway, so let, let's take a step back. In past fellowships, we've discussed how Isaac may not have been fooled by Esau's trickery. Jeremy just talked about this a little bit. He touched on it. And he, he says, you know, that he wasn't tricked by, and, and that's sort of comforting because you'd like to believe that Isaac, the wisdom and the prophecy, that he wouldn't have been so easily fooled by the trickery and the trappings of Esau's mouth. Um, but uh, but rather he understood the violent warlike nature of Esau and his hope in wanting to bless him was that Esau would be able to harness those warrior qualities to protect the meek and peace-loving Jacob. Uh, you know, because I, he saw that there would be vicious haters that would inevitably rise against Jacob. And he thought Esau could be his protector. They're two brothers. It was Isaac's desire to desire to empower Esau to harness these qualities for the protection of his brother Jacob. Isaac wanted them to work together as brothers, each using their natural predispositions to further the goal of the nation of Israel. He, he felt that both of the qualities were needed within the nation of Israel. That was his hope, which is understandable, right? What father doesn't want his sons to work together and to love each other? But Rav Cook teaches that this was not meant to be. And the reason this dynamic duo of Esau and Jacob was not meant to be was because Esau's force and aggression was coming from the wrong place altogether. Right? Esau loved the violence as an end in and of itself. And the love of war and the love of killing and death does not have a place within the nation of Israel. Right? The love of, of violence and carnage does not have a place in the collective hearts of the Jewish people. And that is why both blessings, the blessing intended for Esau as well as that meant for Jacob, both needed to go to Jacob. Because when a Jew does go to war, when a Jew, Jew does pick up arms to fight and kill, it can never be from a place of joy and glee. You know, perhaps from a, a foundation of happiness that we're able to, to destroy evil from the world and sanctify God's name, but never joy and glee from the act of the, the, the murder and the killing, the violence itself. It's just, it's just not us. And the verse that Rav Cook quoted that revealed this truth, when I read it, it brought a sense of peace to my soul. And it brought me to a deep understanding of what's happening within my own heart right now. So Rav Cook explained that when Jacob entered the tent to receive Esau's blessing, as, as you know, right, he put the, the skin of an animal over his arm to imitate the appearance of Esau, as his mother, Rivka, Rebecca, had instructed him. Let's look inside. Genesis chapter 27, verses 22, 23. So Jacob drew close to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. But he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like the hands of Esau, his brother, so he blessed him. Right, Rav Cook teaches that Jacob was merely wearing these warlike qualities of Esau on an external and a superficial level, right? That for Jacob, these qualities of war and violence and fighting are really only skin deep. They were never meant to be internalized into Jacob's essence and loved and reveled in, right? Even if Jacob is forced to step outside of his comfort zone and to fight and to kill, it would never be from that place of love for those things. It would always remain, it must always remain external to his fundamental essence. So if you want to see an example of Jews functioning and behaving in our comfort zone, right? watch the idea of soldiers giving out water to the civilians in Gaza. But that's that's where our comfort zone is. That's where it doesn't take a lot of, you know, uh, encouragement or pushing to get Jews to do that because that's just what we do. Which, by the way, may be one of the reasons why Jews, I think, excel at war so much. Other than the fact that we excel at war because Hashem fights with us and through us, and that is 
the number one reason, the primary reason, and really the only reason. But uh, but there's also, you know, corollary reasons, I think, that strengthen that. And I think it's because exactly because we don't love it, because we don't revel in it. And at the deepest level, of our hearts, we don't we don't want it at all because we don't we don't delight in it the way our enemies do. And this quality allows us to approach the war with a certain sober and dispassionate sort of posture. It allows us to to think and strategize and fight with forethought and consideration, as opposed to Hamas, who we now know, right, preemptively launched their war against Israel without the agreed upon coordination with Iran and the Hezbollah, simply because they couldn't restrain themselves because they so badly wanted to slaughter and massacre and torture and rape the unarmed revelers at the Nova concert. And so it was there that that's why they're just they love it just so much that they see colors and they do stupid things. But anyways, the more I reflected, you know, on this teaching, the more I understood what I myself was going through. I felt like I understood why I was, you know, talk, all this war talk, this anger talk, this I wanted, I wanted talk. I realized that I, I needed to keep the motivation and the desire for war, for war alive within me, because if I didn't, if I didn't keep reflecting on the purity of the evil that had been unleashed upon us, I feared that I may lose the zeal for the war. And, you know, I don't think it's healthy for people to watch these videos that the Hamas filmed with their GoPros. At the beginning, I didn't know what was happening. None of us did. And I watched a few of them and it was horrific and it has scarred me. But I often watch those previews just in my head. I go back to those previews just in my head and I watch them again and I watch them again because I can't lose it. We can't lose it. Because as King Solomon said, there's a time for war and there's a time for peace. And this is a time for war and this is a time to battle against the forces of darkness and evil in the world. Because if we don't, then those forces will thrive and they will multiply and they will strengthen. It's like leaving the cells of a malignant tumor, just leaving a few of them there. And we all know that if that happens, then the indescribable horrors of October 7th are only the beginning. Anyways, because I know myself, and, and and the truth is that the real me, the me of least resistance, is not only named Ari Abramowitz, but also Dr. Schmendrick Flotzenstein, right? The name of my medical clown persona, because I love going to the hospitals dressed as a clown and making kids laugh. All the kids, all the kids, it doesn't matter who, because by nature, I love them all. Whether, like I've told you this before, whether it's Moshe or Mohammed or Joseph or Jihad, I love all of the children. I love all people. It's just simply the way Hashem made me. I can't take credit for it. I don't deserve accolades for it. It's just the way I was designed from the womb. And I imagine most of you in this fellowship, you're you're exactly the same way. So, you know, even when I drive on the roads in Judea and I see Arabs walking along the side of the road in the sun, it's my natural impulse to want to pick them up and give them a ride. And I have to hold myself back and I find that I resent them that I can't give them a ride. That I can't give them a ride because if I do, they may use that opportunity to stab me in the back as sick and pathological as that is. And so, you know, after learning this teaching from Rav Cook and really letting it sit within me, like digesting it, I really was able to look back on those interviews with all my fiery talk of war and understand it in a different context and be at peace of it, even, even to be proud of it, because everything I said was true, but that's the dimension and the level of energy and focus that I really need to be on right now, despite knowing my deeper, deeper desires and motivations. Because, you know, it, it's true, I'm, I, I really am ready to fight and to die, or preferably even to fight and to kill. Uh, you know, I knew that this desire was no different than, you know, the animal hair on Yaakov's arm, right? He needed to put on that hair, on that faithful, faithful day, on that faithful moment, he needed to put that hair on. It was, it was necessary for the time that he was in. And at that moment, he needed to don the hands of Esau. But never would the hands of Esau penetrate into his very essence. That would never happen. It could never happen. It just simply isn't who Jacob was. It isn't who Jacob is. And and that and that's okay. It wasn't supposed to be, you know, part of his essence. Because if it if it did, if it was, he wouldn't be Jacob. He wouldn't be the Jacob that would eventually usher in the light and the peace and the harmony into the world that we will soon see 
brought into the world at the end of days, which, my friends, is any day now between us. I mean, Jeremy, I actually, Jeremy and I have spoken about this. We both feel like this coming Pesach is a big day, even though I promise I'm not going down that route again. You've been here from the beginning with me. You know that. But, you know, any day, any day could really be it. You know, because at the at his very essence, Jacob is a spiritual man and he dwelled in tents. And what was he doing in those tents? He wasn't scrolling through Facebook. He was praying and he was studying and he was seeking to bring the truth and the spirituality of the Torah and of Hashem into the world by infusing it into his very essence. And that's why if you look past the war coverage on CNN and Fox News, if you look at what's really happening on the ground in the Holy Land, you see that Jacob is indeed alive and well. And so I, I want to, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll wind this up in a second, but I, I want to let you in for a moment into the internal life of Jacob, into the real war that is being fought in the heart of Israel at this very moment. Um, and you, but the examples I'm going to give, it was actually really hard to give them because there were thousands of them. Everywhere I look all day, there are thousands. I could have done three fellowships just on this very point. But I thought I would start with this because I didn't have a lot of time. There's the first one that popped up this morning. So here's a message that's being circulated through the Jewish world over the past few days. And this is just, you know, like, like I said, a small example of the spiritual dynamics of the, the real war that's being fought. If you could show that, that slide. It says here that their group, called Achim B'Tfilah, meaning brothers in prayer, was created with one goal, to unite the Jewish people as we strengthen our soldiers with their strongest defense. Tfilah, prayer. Anyways, it goes on to say that it's it's well known that the most dangerous and fierce battles in Gaza take place between the hours of 2 to 6 a.m., a time when Israelis are asleep. And the message goes on to say that IDF soldiers have shared that the time that they feel a weakening of their strength uh, with the, is with the lessening of the prayers that are during that time. So in short, these guys, this sort of initiative they were allocating 10-minute time slots to be filled by Jews from around the world during the time when soldiers need it most. And of course, it filled up like that a hundred times over, um, even though it's like just in, in certain groups, it's just everyone jumps on this immediately. You know, there, there are just so many examples of it. I actually just saw a picture that I've been looking for all day. I spent so long looking for this. So I just want to show you. I don't know if you can see. Can you see that? Can you? Yeah. Mm -mm. I'll, I'll send it to you anyways it's a picture of like a little boy reading the psalms and praying and then just right over a soldier fighting showing the clear connection between those prayers and that soldier fighting and um and you know so there are just so many examples of how the nation of israel is 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 intuitively uh standing together and understands inherently that our strength is in our love for each other and our strength is in our love for Hashem. Even secular Jews are understanding this on the deepest level. That maybe they can't always articulate with words, but is definitely very clear through their actions. And that, that this war will only be won, can only be won in the spiritual realm. I actually just saw this picture this morning, so I thought I would share it with you because it's just from this morning. Ben, can you show that? It's a picture of a rabbi in one of the combat units. It's the same guy on both sides. And his friends were pressuring him to adopt this sort of funny trend in the army that I still don't fully understand of the mustaches. I think it's a throwback to the Yom Kippur War, but I'm not sure exactly. Anyways, they wanted him to do it, and he agreed on the condition that they would all put on tefillin every day until the end of the war. Right? A demand, the phylacteries, you know, that the, the Bible tells us that we put on every day. And they all readily agreed to it. Uh, probably both because they were eager to see him take off this beard that he probably has never had off since he was able to grow a beard, but also because all of them were probably doing it anyways because of the great spirit of return and repentance that is sweeping throughout the nation of Israel and the land of Israel. And so that picture was of him before and after that. And, you know, one of the greatest movements in the spiritual war is the initiative to extricate and remove Lashon Hara from our collective national consciousness. Right, what is the Shonara? Gossip, slander. E it literally means the evil tongue. Every morning after prayer, personally, in my congregation, my uh, the uh, right after prayer, the teacher gets up, one of the rabbis gets up and speaks and shares a different law of the complex and detailed guidelines of guarding our tongue and how we speak about each other. And although at first glance this may seem sort of random or arbitrary or 
You know, like, why are we hyper-focusing on gossip out of all things? But the truth is it's not. Because how we speak about each other is a manifestation of how we see each other. And how we see each other is reflected in how Hashem sees us. And if we love each other unreasonably, above nature, then that is exactly the way Hashem will love us. So here's actually a video of an Israeli tank. Are you ready for this? You got to see this. That sign. Did you see? Did you see the sign there at the very beginning? I don't know, Ben, can you go back to the beginning of it? So that the, there it is. You see that? It's the words, and it has a red circle through it. It says, Lashon Hara, no, forbidden here. And under it, you know, it says, Lashon Hara, evil tongue. This is a gossip-free zone. In Gaza, in Gaza, that there's no gossip allowed in the middle of the deepest, craziest fighting in the in the middle of Gaza. No gossip allowed, no evil tongue. What other army do you know that puts up signs like that in the middle of their war zones. An army that understands that this is a spiritual war. And this was actually the uh, the final video I'm going to share with you right now that was recorded by the holy, brave warrior Yosef Chaim Hershkovitz. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. Father of five children. He was very beloved by everybody. He was like a, a famous guy as far as like Sadiqim are concerned. He was the principal of a boys high school in Jerusalem. Here's the first 20 seconds. We're playing the first 20 seconds. It's a five minute video, but I'll just play the first 20 seconds. That was all he wanted. That was his final request. That was his heart's desire for the nation of Israel to love each other, to see each other in a positive, generous, loving light, and to speak nicely about each other. He goes on to talk about there's no leftist, there's no right wing, there's no left wing. And listen, I don't know if you remember, right before the war, there was very, very heated debates, fights going on about the Supreme Court which I felt very passionately about. And the tactics I saw the other side taking made it very difficult for me to feel that love for them. And I'm sure that he stood exactly where I stood on this issue. Maybe, maybe, maybe you know what, maybe not. I don't know. But one thing I can tell you is that wherever he stood on the issue, it didn't prevent him from loving the diametrical opposite of those that stood against his position because he was able to transcend all of that and love every Jew. And... And that's that's ultimately the, what what this war is about on some level. On one of one of the great fronts of this war internally within the Jewish people, is for us to love each other, and Hashem loves us in exactly that way. And anyways, all of this that I'm saying, this is the real nature of Yaakov, of Jacob, right? Love and light and compassion and spirituality, spiritualizing everything in the world. And, and when your heart is connected to Israel, when you're fighting with Israel and whatever front that you can, then you're fighting the spiritual war with us.